In closing, I would invite um, Vincent to come up and just take us through, well, having thought about all of this, what are the... Uh, please welcome Vincent again. <laughs> So uh, what I'm planning to do is just four slides, just try and summarize all that you've uh, heard so far. Some of these are fairly good recommendations. Some of these you can see the uncertainties. So first of all, we'll go with the, uh, the principle. I've made a lot of advances in myeloma over the last 10, 15 years, mainly because many of you have put your patients on clinical trials many of you patients have been willingly enrolling in clinical trials, so we are learning new things and we are advancing the disease. So in any situation, whether it's newly diagnosed, maintenance, consolidation, relapse, try and see if there is a clinical trial available, and clinical trials are always preferred over any of the algorithms that I'm going to show. And what I'm showing is uh, mainly assuming that if you have access to the drugs that we are talking about, what would you do in the ideal circumstance? And I'm using only commercially available options. So first algorithm is for patient with a newly diagnosed possibly smoldering or multiple myeloma scenario. I already showed you the slide before. Clearly, if the patient has myeloma-defining events, all of us will treat as myeloma. If the patient doesn't have myeloma-defining events and fulfills criteria for smoldering myeloma, the first step to do is to decide whether the patient has a high-risk smoldering myeloma or a low-risk smoldering myeloma. The main features for high-risk will be cytogenetics like DEL17, GAIN1Q, uh, the main, or a 414 translocation, or a very high M spike like more than 3 grams per deciliter or a very high free light chain ratio. If patients have low-risk smoldering myeloma, then clearly observation is enough every three to four months, you want to uh, follow the patient. If the patients have high-risk smoldering myeloma, there are a number of clinical trials, all the way from single-agent daratumumab to the full-blown ascent trial with KRD, DARA, you know, maintenance, and so on. I do feel like there are patients with high-risk smoldering myeloma who are at very high risk of progression, particularly if they have evolving features. That means if the M spike goes up by half a gram and the hemoglobin falls at the same time by half a gram, those patients we have shown have almost a 90% chance of progression. Uh, and so you want to take into consideration patients with evolving features and patients with multiple high-risk fe features and uh, consider therapy in them in light of the Spanish trial, which showed a significant prolongation in overall survival with early intervention. As far as myeloma frontline treatment goes, I think most of us can agree that we would first try and separate patients into transplant candidates and non-transplant candidates. And if botezomib Lendex was available, then using botezomib Lendex for one year, followed by LEN maintenance, would be the standard. VTD or VCD can be used instead of BRD if, if lenalidomide is not approved frontline. There is an abstract at this meeting looking at whether we need to do the dexamethasone. Can we just do one year of BRD and then do len alone rather than len dex so you can spare some side effects? I would uh, encourage you to look at that abstract and go to the session. Preliminary data suggests that you don't need the steroids. If the patient's a transplant candidate, I think most of us agreed we'd go with the VRD induction, autologous stem cell transplantation, and lenalidomide maintenance. The only exception would be for high-risk patients, we might use a bortezomib-based maintenance. This could be either bortezomib alone or bortezomib lendex at low doses. I agree with Dr. Moreau that we don't generally prefer a delayed transplant, but there are some patients, standard risk, Patients really not keen on wanting a transplant at this time. If I had myeloma, I'd probably be like that because I want to just go on with my life and I'm willing to take the risk. Given that overall survival is the same, I think delayed transplant is a reasonable option. But if you're going to do delayed transplant, number one, you should be able to harvest the stem cells and freeze it forever. Number two, you must be willing to use it at first relapse, not wait for second, third, fourth relapse. In the first relapse, 
I think Dr. Moreau mentioned that really everything depends on what, whether the patient's been exposed to lenalidomide or not, because most of our patients are going to be relapsing on lenalidomide maintenance, whether it be in the post-transplant setting or in the frontline setting. If they are clearly refractory to lenalidomide, uh, then I think, uh, sorry, if they are not refractory to lenalidomide, let's say they have not been on lenalidomide or they're taking very small doses of lenalidomide, then daratumumab lendex is probably my reasonable first line option. If they are refractory to lenalidomide, on the other hand, daratumumab botezomib dex or daratumumab palm dex. So basically, I'm favoring a monoclonal antibody-based regimen for the first relapse based on the fact that the hazard ratio for dara-based regimen seems to be much better than the others. It's really not fair to compare like that, but there are no head-to-head -head triplet uh, DARA RD versus KRD or any such randomized trials, so we have to rely on these kind of unfair comparisons. Having said that, I will tell you that it's very unlikely that your patient's going to do worse if you picked a different regimen and say KRD first and then went to DARA POMDEX or vice versa. Um, I think it's most important to have access to the regimens and go some logical fashion with one regimen after the other rather than uh, there's no one right answer. But here are some options that I've given. Almost all of these are approved with the exception of Cybo-D and Ixa-POMDEX and CAR-POMDEX, all of which are active regimens as well. Always consider a salvage autologous transplant in eligible patients. Nowadays, many patients may not have had a transplant, and you might want to tell them that the first, if they're eligible, of a transplant as the treatment for first relapse might be reasonable. After the patient has failed for the first time and now you're talking about a second relapse, the problems become even more complicated. As we said, it really depends on what all regimens they've received before, how aggressive the relapse is, what kind of performance status the patient has, and so on. I have two simple principles. Number one, if you're going to change a regimen or if you need to change a regimen, use a triplet at a minimum. And number two, have at least two new drugs that the patient's not refractory to. And that way you can come up with regimens. We have plenty of them, so you can go on sequentially for multiple lines of therapy. So any of the first relapse options are reasonable. In addition to that, there are some additional options you can consider. Some patients who have very aggressive relapse might need a VDT PACE type regimen. Melphalan is still a great drug, intravenous melphalan at a single dose, or even oral melphalan in combination with other drugs. Venetoclax, particularly for 11, 14 patients. Uh, Bendamustine-based regimens. Adding panabinostat to proteasome inhibitor-based regimens, and starting to try four or five drug regimens may all be reasonable in the absence of clinical trials. Of course, clinical trials at every step needs to be considered. That's all I have, and thank you very much for all your attention. We are happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, uh, thank you so much uh, Vincent, for this uh, overview summary, which I think is very, very helpful for everyone as a, as a takeaway from this afternoon. And so we do have a few moments. If there are any pressing questions, uh, we can take them from the floor, or uh, maybe, the, maybe the, yes? Yes? No, I think there is a question before. Okay, please, go ahead. Thank you for the, do you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the excellent talks. Uh, I have a question. I uh, would like to have your opinion on how you would treat a patient with monoclonal gammopathy of renal significance, especially given that those patients will have an elevated creatinine, you know, based on have coexisting diabetes or because of really monoclonal gammopathy, I would like to have your opinion on how you would approach those patients. Okay, so a tricky situation. Uh, what do you think, Vincent? So it's the same thing as, as the neuropathy question that we have talked about. A lot of us get consults on patients who have a monoclonal protein and for some reason or the other they have an elevated creatinine or a proteinuria, but it's not cast nephropathy, so it's not multiple myeloma. What do you do with these patients? I think the first step is to figure out if the M protein is the one that's causing the renal damage or something else. And that may require a kidney biopsy. Without a kidney biopsy, you cannot make that conclusion. MGRS is like a very general term used to describe a variety of different diseases. And you have to really know precisely what 
MGRS disease are we talking about? So the main ones to keep in mind are membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis and C3 glomerulonephritis, both of which, if you can find monoclonality on the biopsy specimen, then that tells you that it's a renal damage that was caused by the monoclonal protein. And for those patients, we have considered therapy with myeloma-type regimens, such as Cyborg-D. If the patient has light-chain deposition disease or heavy-chain deposition disease, then we treat provided there is something to be treated. That means the patient's not in end-stage renal disease. All the other ne nephrology problems are either rare or there's very, very little data to go into. I see. Like, how long right, do you treat it, Cyborg-D? I would say probably four to six months. We have an algorithm. There is a, uh, for those of you interested, these are complex topics. If you, took, if you Google the Mayo Clinic proceedings, uh, you will find a, two recent reviews, one on monoclonal gammopathy uh, associated renal disorders and, and another one on monoclonal gammopathy related neurologic disorders. Thank yeah, you. Thank you for Over that. Here, Very helpful. Right so we have one more question here. Go ahead. Yeah, it's working now. I think so. Yeah. Uh, thank you to all of you for very beautiful presentations. I really enjoyed it. I have a question to one of my own patients. So she's an elderly woman, not so elderly. Uh, she was induced with uh, four cycles of VRT, uh, got auto autologous transplantation consolidation with two cycles VRT. Um, and uh, I, I had the bone marrow also tested, so she was in a complete response, and within very short time, um, I saw a, a tumor in the iliopsoas, so in the muscle, and it turned out to be an extramedullary disease. So okay. how would you treat this patient in the first relapse now? All right, so uh, early progression, uh, uh, presumably high risk in some fashion, any thoughts? Uh, no, can, 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 I, I so did, so it's VRD, VRD transplant, yeah. and uh, consolidation for two cycles, and then relapse very quickly with extramedullary disease. Okay. And bone marrow is still okay. Bone marrow is okay, right? Yes. Bone marrow is still okay. I, I, in that particular patient, I will try. I will use by sure a monoclonal antibody because he has not been exposed to a monoclonal Absolutely. antibody. I will use pomalidomide because yep. it has not been exposed, and if possible, also a, proteasome, a different proteasome inhibitor, carfilzomib. I, I will try to, to treat this patient as much aggressive as possible because this is a, a very poor prognosis patient. Yeah, those are some simple options. Okay, all right, we have one more, and then I think we'll close, okay? So this final question. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. Can you speak uh, up? I would like to ask a question about the management of uh, CNS myeloma. Any CNS suggestions myeloma, there? okay. Thank you. All right, well, this is a rare one. Uh, uh, does anyone want to comment about uh, that? Shaji, <laughs> so Shaji, I, I, all right, I get you're the, selected. <laughs> I get the most easiest question of the all, right? So, no, I think it's always a challenging um, condition to treat. Um, obviously, I think the main thing is um, at least our practice has been in, in those patients to try intrathecal therapy to clear this uh, CSF, uh, mostly with the triple therapy combination, but then follow that up with systemic therapy using, again, multi-drug combinations that we haven't used. We don't have very good data on how well the monoclonal antibodies necessarily get into the CSF, but I think you know, using uh, at least, we know pomalidomide gets in reasonably well, the IMID, so using a multi-drug combination and IMID, preferably a um, monoclonal antibody, and maybe even using a proteasome inhibitor in that um, combination. There are some ongoing trials looking at some of the newer generation proteasome inhibitors with better CNS penetration. That may be part of clinical trials. So think, see if there's clinical trials. If not, then this may be a reasonable approach in those patients. Yeah. All right. Uh, if I am allowed just to add, pomalidomide partially cross the barrier. And so. this is one possibility. Data is not clear, but it's being claimed that also Partially, marisomib that you were alluding, alluding probably will be the, the drug of choice, but they are not developing in this situation. Obviously, very, I, I, very, very difficult the yeah. prognosis. I, I have a different, completely different issue, particularly for Vincent. Usually in your presentations, you emphasize the need to confirm a CRAP symptom. For instance, if you have 
a myeloma patient that has only 15% plasma cell in the bone marrow and has anemia, you recommend always to exclude other causes of anemia. But the same would apply also for the smoldering patients that have a dubious a focal lesion or an increase on the uh, free light chain that is not expected. Would you mind to comment? Because I think this is a very important just to confirm in this particular type of cases that the result has sense. Yeah, I think the concern about the, the free light is, is important. So, so the, again, to paraphrase the question, which is just absolutely very, very important, is that if you're going to take a patient who doesn't have any symptoms and say that you have multiple myeloma, I'm going to start therapy, we better be really, really sure. So we have laid down criteria in terms of who is called as myeloma, but that doesn't mean we need to, uh, we can suspend judgment. We have to use a lot of judgment to see if, the, if this is really myeloma and if this patient really needs to be treated. Clearly, if the patient has 70, 80% bone marrow plasma cells, that's the easy one. The free light chain ratio more than 100, in general, I'm, I'm very comfortable treating, provided the involved light chain is high. Um, if you have a patient where the urine monoclonal protein is completely negative and the free light chain ratio is high, you have to ask yourself, is this patient really making a lot of free light chains or is it just having a problem excreting them? And if they are dimerizing their light chains, and that's why the free light chain ratio is up, those are not the patients who need to be treated. So we do need to get the 24-hour urine protein electrophoresis. Make sure that whatever high light chains you're seeing is also seen in the urine, which means that the kidney is under threat and you need to do action, and those patients we need to treat. Otherwise, you might be just wanting to watch them. Same thing with the MRI. When we wrote the paper, we said you need to have unequivocal focal lesions of five millimeters or more, and you need at least two of them to be considered as myeloma. And we said, if you have a doubt, please don't do anything. Wait mm -hmm. for three months and repeat the imaging. Very important. Because there is a study which shows that if the number of lesions goes up or if the size goes up, then, then they really progress yeah. to myeloma quickly. But if it doesn't change, then the risk drops. So there's no urgency to treat myeloma. So keep that in mind and always repeat imaging if you're, if you're not sure of it. Always repeat the light chain, check the urine, and, and make a judgment call, particularly asymptomatic patients. All right. So these are very, very helpful final thoughts. So thank you. Uh, so let's give a great uh, thank you to the panel here. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. So thank you.